but hopefully I can teach you guys some things tonight. We're going to talk about steroids. Um, so I'm definitely going to be talking about corticosteroids, immunosuppressives, and uh, other immunomodulatory drugs, mostly from a dermatologic perspective. So you could talk to an internist or a neurologist, and they might have a completely different opinion on how to do these things. So that's kind of my disclaimer, um, mostly from a derm perspective, but we will bring up uh, some other diseases that these drugs can be used for. Um, and we're mostly going to be talking about immune-mediated dermatoses, but we'll mention some diseases that would need anti-inflammatory doses of, of some of these drugs. We're going to do a quick, hopefully pretty painless review of the immune system and autoimmunity. So it arises from dysregulation of the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, or sometimes both. And I think the important thing to remember is that it is multifactorial. So there's more than one factor going into what's going wrong in the body, and that's why they're so hard to treat. You know, so if it was just one aspect of the immune system or just one part of inflammation, we wouldn't have so much trouble with these diseases. So innate and adaptive immune systems. The innate immune system is, of course, things like epithelial bar barriers, mucous membranes. And they contain things like antimicrobial proteins, um, which I think is going to be a big push for shampoo, FYI, in the future, coming from companies like Furback um, in order to avoid systemic antibiotics, FYI. So that's something I would look out for at the conferences. But it's also things like phagocytic and natural killer cells, and the key interaction for our innate uh, immune system in regards to autoimmunity is going to be the dendritic antigen-presenting cell encountering a foreign antigen. And most of the time, in a normal immune system, this is going to be a pathogen. Um, but sometimes an allergen, something like a pollen that's not supposed to cause a reaction, or even an autoantigen will cause problems. And actually, it's a pretty specific process. We used to kind of think, OK, skin blocks things, mucous membranes block things, the respiratory tract blocks things. But um, actually, it's a lot more specific than that. And then we knew the adaptive system was uh, a lot more specific. And it's got highly specialized cells, and they create an immunologic memory. Um, so great for preventing future disease, not great for allergy. This is kind of a tough slide, um, which is great for people who have to take dermatology boards and not so great for everyday life. We have our naive CD4 positive T cell. And this is just, it's a, it's a long list, but not an inclusive list of what these things can be differentiated into. And so we have our Th1 cells and our Th2 cells, and those are kind of what you guys probably are um, most familiar with. But now there's all these different uh, subsets that do different things. Th1 as well as Th17 are going to be more important for cell-mediated immunity and kind of generalized inflammation. Like Th17, for example, is going to be your most important neutrophil recruiter. Um, Th2 and Th9, they're going to be more important for humoral immunity and things like allergic skin disease. Th regulatory cells we know are also really important in allergy, but we know that because there's not enough of them. And this is true for autoimmune disease as well. And then Th3 cells are also important for tolerance. And that's all we're going to do detail-wise on that. <laughs> um, I'm going to put a case in right away just so we can start thinking about things from a clinical perspective. And we're just going to kind of touch on him throughout the presentation as an example of how we might use these drugs. So Moose is a four-year-old male castrated miniature dachshund. And he presented to me um, after about 10 days of some crusted skin lesions. His paw pads were super painful. And I think that was actually the very first thing the owners noticed was um, that he was lame and, and having trouble walking, almost kind of the walking on eggshells type of description. And then he was a little bit itchy on some of these lesions as well. So when he got to me, he was on Clavamox, Hydroxazine, and Rimadyl. Um, Remedial for the pain of the paw pads, but kind of a thought of this being potentially pyoderma or allergic skin disease, pyoderma being the sequela of the allergic skin disease. He also had a little bit of a low-grade fever and was a little bit lethargic, um, not his normal self, not eating as well as he normally does. On presentation, on dermatologic exam, he did have crusts and ulcerations of the nose. And you can see, actually, uh, it's not just these erosions and ulcerations and these proliferative crusts. There's also depigmentation of the nose, and you lose that really nice, normal, cobblestone appearance of the nasal planum. And that can happen in quite a few diseases. Also, he had papules, pustules, crusts along the trunk um, and in the inguinal region. He had crusts on both the concave and convex aspects of his penna. And then there was hyperkeratosis with fissuring and ulceration of the paw pads, explaining his lameness. 
we did a little bit of cytology. We saw some sheets of neutrophils and, and scattered in there we saw some acantholytic cells, which you guys know are our kind of fried egg appearance cells. Um, if you go down to your um, highest power, you'll also note um, on cytology that he did not have any evidence of infectious organisms at this time. So we went ahead and did a biopsy that day, of course having the suspicion of pemphigus foliaceus given our acantholytic cells. And uh, our biopsy came back with a um, histopathologic description of separative dermatitis with intra and subcorneal pustules con containing acantholytic keratinocytes. Slam dunk, we have our diagnosis. Um, if you remember, I said he was on Remedil for the pain before, so we want to make sure we give it a nice five-day washout period. But then we did start the 2.2 mg per kg um, of prednisone. So back to autoimmunity, some more textbook stuff for right now. I mentioned it's multifactorial and complex. So you're going to have to, um, in order to have a, an immune, immune reaction, you need a lack of your T regulatory lymphocytes, as well as inappropriate presentation of autoantigen by that antigen presenting cell that I mentioned earlier. And so when you have these two things, and it's not just these two, but you can imagine there's other things going wrong, it allows excess activation of TH1 cells, and this is going to be important in diseases involving cytotoxic destruction of cells. So lymphocytic thyroiditis would be a great example of that. Or you could have excess activation of, of Th2 cells. And that's going to be more important for diseases uh, involving autoantibody production. So IMHA, pemphigus foliaceus. We'll talk a little bit about predisposing and trigger factors for immune-mediated disease. Genetics is going to be uh, one of our big predisposing factors. And actually now we know that inheritance of particular alleles of the MHC gene will um, make an animal at a way higher risk for immune-mediated disease. And just really quick, we're not going to go into detail here, but just for you guys to remember what the MHC gene makes, it's a set of cell surface proteins that, that is required for the acquire, acquired immune system to recognize foreign molecules. So MHC class 1 and class 2, we won't go into what those do, but we know that they're required for that um, mispresentation of an autoantigen. So the diseases that have been proven for this are IMHA and lymphocytic thyroiditis. And that's not every case, of course. Um, and I think in particular for the IMHA, it was cocker spaniels that they proved had that gene mutation of that allele. Other predisposing factors for immune-mediated disease would be things like age, gender, once again, depends on the disease process, and then poor lifestyle choices, which is described more in human medicine um, than with our animals. And then we have triggering factors for immune-mediated immune mediated disease. And we're actually lucky if we actually identify one of these. Most of the time, we're going to call it an idiosyncratic reaction. We can blame genetics. We can just say, I'm not sure what's going on. But you have to keep in mind that it could have been triggered by something. So infectious agents, for sure, um, the most important of which probably are the arthropod transmitted organisms. Um, so you can consider doing tick titers or even a 40X if you diagnose an immune mediated disease. Um, a lot of times I find these workups are a bit of um, trying to find a needle in a haystack and you spend a lot of money and the owner now can't afford their treatment and the blood work monitoring that they need for the disease. So a lot of times I say, okay, you know, we're not going to figure it out. If there's a really obvious one, like they had their rabies vaccine two months earlier, um, you might consider doing titers the next time. Um, that's a more complicated question, but vaccines are definitely a potential. Drugs are a potential. And then, of course, neoplasia. And then talk about needle in a haystack. Okay, let's do chest rads, abdominal ultrasound. Um, you're going to spend all their money. Um, so a lot of times, unless they really want you to, we don't do all these things. But what is our first line in immune-mediated disease? Of course, it's going to be glucocorticoids. Um, and you pretty much need them, you know, in most cases. Unless there's a dramatic reason why you can't use them, we're going to. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but we'll work through it together. So here's our little steroid hormone. I'm just going to tell you a little bit how they work. They passively diffuse through this. Uh, cell membrane into the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is where they're going to meet with this steroid receptor or glucocorticoid receptor. And then remember that little yellow piece kind of in your mind because we're going to bring it up a couple more times throughout the presentation. 
And then uh, there's actual migration of that full complex into the nucleus where it's going to bind to the glucocorticoid response element, which is the part um, before the area of DNA that needs to be um, transcribed and then translocated. But the steroid can actually either upregulate or downregulate that process. So you're either making more proteins for a certain process or you're preventing them from being made. And steroids can do everything, essentially. That's kind of the long road of what they do. The, there's actually pretty immediate effects from glucocorticoids as well through intracellular signaling as well as a cell membrane interaction. Um, and I won't go into details of that because it's really not fun. <laughs> but effects of glucocorticoids, this is a little bit dense as well, but I just want to give you guys a good idea of how many things they're doing. Um, and this is only in regards to the immune system. At our anti-inflammatory doses, it's going to stabilize the cell membranes of our granulocytes, our mast cells and our macrophages. So if you think about the key players in inflammation, stabilizing all those guys, we're going to inhibit phospholipase A2, which is going to shut down that arachidonic acid pathway as well as its metabolites, uh, metabolites that are pro-inflammatory. It's going to prevent release of really important cytokines like IL-1 and IL-6. It's going to affect the complement, which is another important um, aspect of the uh, innate immune system. And it's going to downregulate the FC receptor expression on our macrophages. And that is probably why steroids work really quickly with IMHA in helping. It's because there's not as many of those ST receptors, and that's what binds to the red blood cell autoantibody and phagocytizes it. So if we don't have as many of those, we're not going to be breaking down as many red blood cells. At immunosuppressive doses, and you've got to think, this is also doing this, not instead of doing this. You're going to have reduction in antigen processing by your dendritic cells. Uh, you're going to have direct suppression of your T lymphocytes. And you're also going to have reduced affinity of antibody to cell mem membrane epitopes. So your antibodies aren't going to bind quite as well. More general kind of intuitive points about glucocorticoids that I think are important. The effects of these things are nonspecific regardless of the cause of inflammation. So you've got to consider that. You know, you're going to get all of these side effects regardless of what type of inflammation or disease process, process that you're treating. This makes intuitive sense as well, but you've got to reach the site of inflammation to be effective. You know, so um, the dose... The um, degree of response is actually proportional to the amount of glucocorticoid that you're making it making into that tissue. And just because inflammation is different uh, for every case, you want to keep that in mind. This is why they change what you would what you would recommend patient and disease wise. Um, some other really big factors in influencing the effect of steroids would be potency of the drug. And um, we'll talk about that just a little bit later on. Protein binding, for example. So um, an animal with a low serum albumin is going to be more susceptible to toxic effects of steroids. And then, of course, route of administration is very important. So oral steroids are typically rapidly absorbed, um, while the parenteral versions are usually insoluble. They're really slowly, and therefore they're going to have a much more significant effect on the adrenal access. And then, of course... All of our desirable effects of glucocorticoids are the same things that are causing our adverse effects. So you can't take one without the other. So it's just really important to make sure your diagnosis is accurate, and that way you can help better determine the appropriate dose and duration that you need for this particular disease. And then, of course, I'm biased. So um, glucocorticoids, what are our dermatologic indications? Our hypersensitivity disorders, um, super important. Obviously, atopic dermatitis is a big one. They help with flea bite hypersensitivity. They help with adver adverse food reactions. Um, should you be using them long term for those diseases? No. And then, of course, otitis, those otitis externa cases, uh, particularly, you can't even get medications down into the ear because the canals are so swollen. Certainly, uh, an anti inflammatory dose of steroids would be indicated. Most importantly for this talk are immune-mediated dermatoses. And I just say most important because these are the cases that are going to need chronic, if not lifelong, treatment with steroids um, and these secondary agents that we're going to talk about as well. So goals of glucocorticoid use. This is pretty intuitive, but infrequently as possible, as low of a dose as possible, alternate day regimens when possible, and then only when you don't have any other safer alternatives. You know, so for... Atopic dermatitis, for example, a lot of dogs could be maintained on antihistamines, frequent bathing. Arguably, drugs like Apoquil or Atopica would be safer long-term on a daily basis, or allergy vaccine. And if the owners are willing to do it, that's something where we might be able to avoid steroids for this patient lifelong. 
We mentioned route of administration before, so we have some options. Of course, um, oral steroids, injectable and topical, and oral administration is definitely the preferred long-term route. And for one thing, you can really closely regulate it. So, for example, if you're going to have an adverse uh, behavioral side effect for some reason, it's going to be great to be like, okay, stop them right now, you know, at day two, as opposed to something that's going to last for several weeks. You can, you can withdraw them rapidly as well. And then, arguably most importantly, it's the safest physiological route, and the effects on the adrenal access are going to be a lot fewer. Um, especially if you can get to more than a 48-hour dosing regimen, um, as well as the long-term side effects um, that we'll talk about briefly coming up. So IM injections, Depomedrol, everyone knows, knows it, everyone uses it. These are the kind of labeled doses that they recommend for animals. Um, the effect can last between one week and six months. So think about that. That's a long time. And guess what? You don't get to pick. <laughs> and so that's the tough part of this drug. And I get why it's so attractive to give it. Um, most frequently, it's an angry cat. You know, and the owner can't get near it, doesn't want to get near it, or it ruins their entire relationship for them to be given a pill every day or every other day. I totally understand that. If you can give two to three injections a year if they're adequately spaced out, that's probably going to be safe long term for that pet. Um, if it's more than that, generally we say the risks are going to override the drawbacks of difficulty giving oral steroids. You can also give them intralesionally. It's going to be few and far between that this is an appropriate route, but things like acryl lick, and I will say, you know, caveat is please, please, please address the infective or the infected aspect of these lesions because they're almost always infected. So um, steroids alone are not going to fix the problem, but if you're treating the infection with good topicals, if you got them on systemic antibiotics um, with the appropriate drug and you do an injectable steroid, it might really help them. And then things like eosinophilic granulomas and indolent ulcers in our kitties with the eosinophilic granuloma complex, it's um, definitely warranted. A lot of times uh, our oral steroids will not get rid of these lesions alone. They do obviously typically have to be sedated for that. And then triamcin alone is going to be the glucocorticoid of choice for these most of the time. Another important thing is you're going to get all of your systemic effects potentially from doing this as you would with oral steroids or other injectable steroids. So just keep that in mind and choose your dose appropriately. Yes? So if this is a systemic steroid, mm -hmm. why is it working better when you put it in the lead? Just because that's your, uh, what we talked about, um, the dose of the drug at the site of inflammation. So you're getting way more at the site of inflammation than you're getting systemically. Exactly. Yeah. So you're going to get the systemic effects even and I won't go down this road, but even ear medications like Mometamax that they said, oh, it's not going to get absorbed systemically, we know that affects their adrenal access. So, you know, and I would do the dosing based on the appropriate anti-inflammatory dose for a dog of that weight, just in case, you know, especially with risks of things like GI ulcer for a parenteral drug. I would do that to be safe. And then pulse IV therapy. I don't do it if you guys are brave and you really want to. There are definitely protocols that are written up. I know that the uh, dermatologists at NC State will do it and have generally very good success, um, especially for diseases like pemphigus foliaceus. They get them into remission really quickly. They do have to be hospitalized. The biggest risk is typically GI ulcer. For me, we, t we do pretty well with just oral steroids at the appropriate dose, and we don't have those risks. And it doesn't cost as much because you're not hospitalizing the patient. So for me, we don't do it. But it's definitely there's protocols that are written up. It's just a conversation of risk versus benefit with your owners. And then dosage. This is a tough one. All of our current recommendations are really based on clinical experience and not scientific data. Um, and sort of extrapolated from human medicine as well. But once again, every patient is different and you need to individualize treatment for that particular patient. Our doses we talk about in terms of prednisone or prednisolone usually. So if you guys call me um, and I recommend switching steroids, I'm going to say do a 2.2 milligram pred equivalent, but for this drug it's blank, you know, and we'll get to a little chart that should help with that. For dogs, our physiologic dose, which should approximate the daily cortisol that's produced by normal individuals. This is high to me. This is what the textbooks say. So 0.2 to 1.0. Um, Linda Frank, for those of you who went to UT, would say 0.25 mg per kg per day is a physiologic dose. 
anti-inflammatory doses, 1.1 to 2.2 for our dogs. And then maintenance, and I'm going to harp on this, lower it as much as you can. And optimally, you want it between 0.25 and 0.5 every other day if they're going to have to be on it chronically. So that really gives their adrenal access a break. And then immunosuppressive doses, usually we're going to start at 2.2 mg per kg per day in dogs. Um, once again, optimally, you're going to want it to be below a mg per kg every 48 hours. And these are, are diseases where we're really worried because they're on these drugs chronically. And I will tell you just from a personal opinion, I usually do the 2.2 mg per kg once daily. And I have them do it in the morning. Um, and you can talk to your clients about it, but I think it's usually easier for them to let, let their dog out to pee during the day than to get woken up in the middle of the night. And you get the same efficacy if you're doing it once daily as splitting it up. So personal preference, um, you should get the same physiologic effects if you split it up. I also think it makes the tapering a bit easier and less confusing. Cats are going to be a little bit different. So our dose for anti-inflammatory as well as immunosuppressive therapy is going to be about double. So when you're talking anti-inflammatory in a cat, you're starting at 2.2 mg per kg. You are talking about 4.4 mg per kg in immunosuppressive dosing. This is just kind of a fun fact, but remember that little yellow piece that was our glucocorticoid receptor in the cytoplasm? We think that cats tolerate steroids better than dogs because they have fewer of those. Um, so that fun fact, that's why they don't have all of the PUPD pantene. Um, you know, their biggest side effect is risk of diabetes, probably. And then they can get, of course, the long-term ones as well. It's just not as prevalent. Once again, every other day therapy is really important for the adrenal access. And then this is a chart um, that I mentioned are some of the common ones we use. Um, honestly, I use PRED, prednisolone, methylpred, and dex, and those are really the ones that I use. PRED is going to be a first choice, and then so if you look at your potency, your uh, cortisol or hydrocortisone is going to be a 1, your PRED's at about 4. Methylpred is similar, dex you're going up to 29, so this is 7 to 8 times more powerful. Usually, if I'm doing 2.2 mg per kg PRED equivalent, I just roll the decimal point over and say 0.2 mg per kg of dex. It's that powerful. So I usually get good results out of that. If I need to creep up after that, I can, but I usually don't need to. And then methyl PRED I usually use in place of PRED if it's doing the anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive job that I want but they have maybe behavioral side effects or they're literally peeing their owners out of house and home because every drug is different for every dog and so they might tolerate that one a little bit better. Regimen, this is another tough one. There's no correct method. I get a lot of phone calls about this. You know, how do you do your taper? I make it up <laughs> for every patient. You know, so some good examples would be that, of course, anti-inflammatory is going to require a shorter daily uh, dosing period as opposed to your immunosuppressives. Um, and then, so for example, maybe for flea allergy dermatitis for a dog that's not on flea control, they might just need three days of once daily therapy. I don't worry about tapering for that short of a period of time. If they don't need the, the anti-itch properties anymore, I, I don't taper them. For something like endotitis you know, externa where they're really severe and I want to do seven days of daily therapy, I might go once daily for seven days and every other day for seven days. The steroids that dogs are on for immunosuppressive purposes, you're going to want to do it longer. So 14 to, 20 to 21 days of daily therapy. That's why you got to keep close tabs on these folks. Just make sure they're looking for melanin, make sure that they're looking for all the right side effects. Dexamethasone, I usually only go 9 to 10 days of daily and then go to every other. Because you can still get them into remission on dex every other day because this is how long it's staying in their body. And then I go to every other day as my immediate taper. And then how you do it just totally depends on the disease and if we're adding in another agent, which we're going to talk about shortly. Pemphigus, they're going to be on steroids the rest of their life. So to get them to dexamethasone twice weekly at a 0.1 mg per kg dose, great. You know, as long as they're tolerating it from their monitoring. Um, we kind of talked about that already. Just make, remember our goals. And then I think the best way to achieve these goals with steroids is to you do a second or third immunosuppressive agent. We're not going to talk about side effects. You guys all know these. And then, because I'm biased, once again, some skin stuff, but thinning of the skin, alopecia, milia, and comedones. Make sure you're checking for Demodex every time the dog gets a new lesion if they're immunosuppressed because that can be causing it. And you don't want to confuse yourself. Is this the disease or is it Demodex? Um, and then this is just a really cool picture of calcinosis cutis in a dog. 
Um, this is actually for allergic skin disease, and he was just on steroids for long enough. And that location, the dorsal cervical area, is really classic. But he had, well, here's some alopecia, but he had great calcinosis cutis lesions on his back here. And if anybody has questions about treating calcinosis cutis, we can entertain those later. Um, and then this is a soapbox thing, because it is. But I think a lot of other dermatologists have the same opinion as me, and I get about once a week a client in with one of these powerful topical steroids. Genesis is triamcinolone. It's not available right now, but they're probably going to bring it back. And then our Neopredef powder and Jenna spray. It, it's sounds like a good idea for things like hot spots or pedal paritis. Owners don't know how to use them appropriately. And so essentially, they'll use it for a pyoderma that's itchy. They keep spraying it, keep spraying it, keep spraying it. This lesion walks in and they think they're just not curing their pyoderma. But that's all thin skin, um, hyperpigmentation, there's some milia in there, and that's all from Jenna Spray. And it happens at least once a week where they're being inappropriately used by the client because they just like to spray everything. So give them something with chlorhexidine in it instead and no steroid. So that's my soapbox. Why are the side effects so severe and wide ranging of steroids? Once again, that little yellow piece that we showed you in the cytoplasm, those things, they're in the cytoplasm of almost every cell type, for one thing. There's a ton of them. And then Additionally, they can affect a ton of different genes, so that's why they're so widespread. Next question would be, why are my steroids not working for X disease process that I'm trying to treat? Sometimes we call it glucocorticoid failure because the side effects are too severe and we just haven't gotten the pet into remission. And that's still a failure. You know, they were getting them there, but if we can't use them the way we want to because of the side effects, it's still a fail. And then there's actually glucocorticoid resistance. And I see it pretty frequently, probably before... Uh, more than you guys do because we've seen dogs that are on prednisone for <coughs> pemphigus, but they're tough cases and they come out of remission and then you put them back on immunosuppressive doses and it doesn't work anymore. There's some studies out in the human literature, up to 30% of patients treated have a resistance. Um, there was only one pilot study in dogs that didn't get published, but it showed resistance in about one out of seven healthy dogs. So that's a pretty high percentage. So that's why we use these drugs. So cyclosporin, maybe the most common other immunosuppressive drug that we use. Mycophenolate, leflunamide, azathioprine, chlorambicil, doxy. We'll talk about all of them, some of them a little bit more than others. The idea is to get this glucocort glucocorticoid sparing effect so we can achieve those goals. So we're back to moose. He got, first of all, how did I even find, like, that was on Etsy. I was like, really? Moose and a dachshund? Great. Um, so he was worse in 48 hours. So it was really frustrating. They come back in. The dog doesn't feel good. The feet are still painful. Um, he's got new pustules and papules everywhere. So of course, we do our cytology again. There are neutrophils and acanthalytic cells. Go down to our highest power. No infectious organisms. So we switched up to steroid. So we're doing DEX at 0.2 mg per kg every 24 hours. And then we added in a second agent, which we'll save. It's a mystery. It's not Atopica. So we'll talk about Atopica first, and then we'll get to some others. It's derived from a fungus, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but it's got some pretty microscopic pictures. And then the mechanism um, of action. It's a little bit complicated, but not terrible. So cyclosporin actually binds to a separate second molecule that then inhibits calcineurin. So we call it a calcineurin inhibitor, but it's got to bind to something else first. Calcineurin is important because it activates via dephosphorylation nuclear factor of activated T cells. So it's just an enzyme activation pathway, signaling pathway essentially. Um, we call it NFAT, but it's really important for inflammation. So it regulates all of these cytokines. IL-2 is probably the most important of these, and we'll get to that in a second why, but these are all pro-inflammatory cytokines and important. IL-2 is likely the most important factor in T lymphocyte um, growth and proliferation and activation. So that's why cyclosporin works against T cells. And it's probably a drug that's going to target more of your um, cell-mediated response, so Th1 cells, and not so much the humoral response. Quick diagram to show you what we just talked about, but here's our cyclosporin molecule. It binds to cyclophilin, which then inactivates calcineurin. So when calcineurin's active, it's going to dephosphorylate in fat, and then it can go downstream to create all of those fancy proteins that we need for inflammation. Once, once again, IL-2, probably the most important. Formulations, uh, I do want to touch on this because I think there's some important points. 
But um, I don't know if you guys, anyone has used the sand immune, but it was the original formulation. It's in vegetable oil. Really poor absorption with this formulation. It depends uh, highly on biliary excretion. So if you're not getting biliary excretion at the right intervals, then you're not going to get absorption. And so just unpredictable at best. Now we have our modified cyclosporin. Uh, which is the microemulsified formulation. So this is the type that atopic it is. It's the modified cyclosporin, and it improves the oral bioavailability, um, you know, 10 to 15 percent, which is pretty good. We don't rely on biliary excretion anymore. Like I said, this is what atopica is. Now this drug is tough. Um, there is really dramatic variation, inter and intra individual uh, variation in bioavailability. Not only is dog one going to have different absorption from dog two, but dog one is going to have different absorption on Monday than it did on Wednesday. It's just really hard to predict. Um, there are things that the box will say to help absorption. So it says, don't give it with food. It gets absorbed better. And that is true. They do the pharmacokinetic studies. That's true. But then they also did some studies to see, and this is in atopic dermatitis, not immune-mediated disease, but they did a study with atopy, and there was zero clinical correlation with the absorption, the blood levels, and clinical efficacy. So we don't care if it's going to help them or help prevent vomiting. So we usually say, give it with food. Now I will tell you, there was a small study of just a few dogs where there was no difference between GI side effects in dogs that got fed with the drug and not. So... Is it really helping? We don't know, but we think so. Next little tip, freezing the capsules can help mitigate uh, vomiting, and we'll, we'll hit that again. The reason I bring it up now is that they did a study to show that the pharmacokinetics would be the same between frozen and non-frozen, and they are. So we know that much. They haven't done the second half of the study, or at least some residents doing it as we speak um, in regards to if it actually helps with the vomiting. Clinically, I think it helps immensely. So we have almost every patient freeze the capsules. Generic cyclosporin. This is just a quick point for you guys to think about. And the way we do it is we try to get owners to commit to 60 days of name brand therapy. Commit to 60 days. That's when we get the best efficacy of the drug is by that time. Um, and we want it to be name brand because there was a study using generic cyclosporin, once again in, in Atopy, and there was a 25% failure rate compared to the name brand. So if you use the generic and it fails, the dog's still itchy, you don't know if it's because it's the generic or if it's because that drug doesn't work for that dog or cat. And you know, then you've wasted two months of not that inexpensive of a generic product. It's really not that much cheaper. A little bit, but not that much. Compounded cyclosporin, um, we don't trust very far at all. So I think it's kind of a waste of money. But like I said, if you want to mess around with the generic or the compounded, prove it first. You know, get them to, you know, prove that it works for that disease in that patient. Clinical use, initially used for transplant medicine in humans. The only thing it's labeled for in veterinary medicine is atopy. Um, and these are our labeled dosages. There are some other diseases that we use, particularly in dermatology. Perianal fistulas, it's our first line of therapy. Sebaceous adenitis, it's our first line of therapy. We can use it as first or second line, it, line in discoid lupus erythematosus, um, which is always fun to say in front of a lot of people. And then pemphigus foliaceus. And I'll tell you, we don't usually choose this drug as a first or second line therapy. So usually we're going to do steroids a different drug, and then maybe cyclosporin if we're getting failure. And it's because it doesn't work very well compared to a lot of our other drugs. Why doesn't it work? My running theory is that pemphigus foliaceus is more of a humoral disease where it's autoantibody driven, and we know that cyclosporin targets more of the Th1 cells and cell-mediated immunity. So maybe that's why we're not getting as good of efficacy with that drug. Just a theory. A quick note on monitoring therapeutic le blood levels of cyclosporin, and everybody's probably heard of doing this. We know it's not useful for atopic dermatitis. So we kind of mentioned this before, but with the feeding, but there's a total lack of correlation between blood concentration of the drug and clinical response. We already talked about how variable the bioavailability is between every patient. And so we really don't even have a great therapeutic level for different diseases in dog and cat species. It's a lot of money, and it's probably not going to help you very much. The best thing to do is just monitor for response to therapy. 
adverse effects, vomiting, going to happen in 25 to 31% of patients that take it for the first time. That's a third. That's a lot. So we talked about um, potentially things that can mitigate this, freezing the, cap the capsules, metoclopramide, serenia, zofran, um, giving it with food maybe. But those are things you can think about. If it's a dog that the owner's like, they throw up on cephalexin, you might be like, okay, maybe we should send home some serenia prophylactically. Diarrhea, 15%, still pretty high. Pumpkin, probiotics, metronidazole. You guys are quite good at treating diarrhea, I'm sure. More fun, adverse effects, gingival hyperplasia. That's kind of a fun one. Um, I will say that um, it'll get better if you keep a close eye on it, if you stop the drug quickly enough. People talk about azithromycin. Um, I don't treat for it very often, but the word on the listserv is that it doesn't help very much. And a lot of times you're end up doing cryotherapy or sending them to the dentist um, if it's bad enough. And then cutaneous papillomatosis is a possibility with this drug. It's been documented. And then actually hirsutism is a documented adverse effect for the drug. For my patients, it is not an adverse effect. It is great. Please grow all the hair you want to. Owners love it. More serious side effects. Neoplasia, you have to talk about it. The data would suggest that it doesn't happen any more frequently than it does in age-related patients not on the drug. But there's been documented cases of lymphoma, other malignancies, and then there's the internet. And this is true for Apoquil too. But the conversation that I have with owners is, theoretically, this is a drug that suppresses the immune system. The immune system is responsible for finding cancer cells and killing them. So is there a theoretical increased risk for this uh, drug to, you know, is it the increased risk for cancer to spread more easily or grow more easily? I would say yes, there probably is. It depends on how long the patient has to be on it. If they're on it daily for the rest of their life, I'd be way more concerned than a dog that's on it every other day. But you have to have the conversation with the owner. And is there a safer alternative? Infectious disease, increased risk for infection, sure, we're suppressing the immune system. Um, I saw a dog that was on cyclosporin for sebaceous adenitis that had a bunch of draining lesions. And we did a cytology and a scrape. And on both of them, you could see ectothrix spores from, it was microsporum gypsum, all over his body. And it's a soil one. No one in the house had lesions. No other pet had lesions. So it was just him because he was on this drug. A big one that gets talked about as well, toxoplasmosis. Important points that they've brought up in the literature is that recrudescence of toxo in seropositive cats receiving the labeled dose of cyclosporin is unlikely. So you had a seropositive cat. You give it cyclosporin at the labeled dose, recrudescence is unlikely. I don't have the percent number for you, but it's got to be pretty small for them to say that. Cats infected before they're put on cyclosporin therapy did not develop clinical uh, illness after administration. So something else to think about. Your big risk is going to be cats on high doses of cyclosporin that then get exposed. They're immunosuppressed and then you're exposing them to toxo. I counsel my owners of cats on Atopica that they need to be an indoor cat at this point. You also should talk about doing titers, even though they're a pain in the butt, especially for women in the household that might be procreating. Most owners, you talk about risk, they don't want to do them, but of course there's a lot of owners, okay, yes, we're trying to have a baby, let's talk about this. This is a slide from UGA's um, lab that I think is really helpful. And that's actually what I studied for my board exam. I no longer have them memorized, even though it's only been five months. <laughs> but it's just a really good cheat sheet on how to interpret your toxotiters and kind of what to do next. So I won't make you guys go through and read that. But um, I would just Google Toxotiter Cats UGA. And it's, it's a really good um, tool to help you interpret your titers. And, you know, warning owners that, hey, we're, we're probably going to be doing this more than once, you know. And then drug interactions is always a fun discussion point for cyclosporin because there are a ton of them. It relies on the cytochrome P450 pathway of metabolism. So any drug that inhibits cytochrome P450 is going to increase your levels of cyclosporin. Any drug that um, activates the cytochrome P450 is going to decrease your serum levels of cyclosporin. And are you guys ready for this? This is a short list. <laughs> of potential drug interactions that involve cytochrome P450. So all of these are drugs that could increase concentrations. And we use some of them more than others, but there's a lot on here that we use. And then these are drugs that can decrease the blood concentrations of cyclosporin. And I think this is the vet clinics one 
I, I had a couple of charts that I was choosing from, but I think the Vet Clinics of North America summary of cyclosporin is, has this chart. The big ones that we typically use um, would be like rifampin and phenobarbital that decrease the levels of cyclosporin. I wouldn't be using rifampin and cyclosporin or cyclosporin and phenobarbital probably because I'm a wuss about the liver. Maybe because I don't remember how to treat it anymore. But uh, I would just be really careful when you're using drugs on this list and cyclosporin. Maybe the, the most important one um, to talk about increasing blood levels is ketoconazole. It inhibits the cytochrome P450. It also inhibits P glycoprotein, which is the one that pumps it into the intestinal lumen. So you have dis decreased pumping of that, so you're going to have even higher levels. So you can actually reduce your dose of cyclosporin up to 75 to 90 percent of the time. The dose would be your normal dosing for keto, so five mg per kg per day. And then you can start with two and a half mg per kg of cyclosporin. Um, keto used to be really cheap. It's not as cheap as it was anymore. I worry about their liver a bit more when they're on both of the drugs. So I would say make sure that you're getting a baseline, and we'll talk about monitoring baseline blood work for these dogs, and then monitoring you know, maybe a month later, then three months later, and then every six to 12 months. Maybe you would just save more money by monitoring for atopica every six months. Just something to think about. And then once again, the caveat with doing ketoconazole and cyclosporin is make them commit to 60 days of regular therapy to see if it works. Because once again, if it fails, is it because the keto is not increasing the blood levels enough, or is it because this drug doesn't work for this dog and this disease? We're going to talk about azathioprine next. It is a thiopurine, which just means that it interferes with purine synthesis. And so we need these nucleotide bases for our RNA and our DNA. And if we inhibit them, that cell is going to die. Um, once again, it's a little bit more important for cell-mediated immunity, um, but it also suppresses uh, the T lymphocyte antibody response as well. So we're getting a humoral aspect with this drug more than cyclosporin. And it, it targets lymphocytes specifically, so um, not just one type, but a lot of them, and it's because they lack a salvage pathway for purine synthesis. In other words, other cells in the body don't need these analogs to make these bases, but lymphocytes do. And so that's why it's a little bit more specific for that cell type, which is kind of cool. Clinical use for this medication, once again, originally used in people uh, to prevent transplant rejection. Also used really frequently in immune-mediated disease in people. It enables sustained remission even after, while tapering and after withdrawal of glucocorticoids. And so once again, this is our glucocorticoid sparing effect. We're trying to prevent these kind of predictable side effects from the steroids with these other drugs that do have some toxicities, but usually they're more of an idiosyncratic reaction. It's got a delayed onset of action when you're comparing it with steroids. So it's going to take several weeks. And I would say you should see response within two, three weeks, but peak response, we're talking six weeks, maybe eight weeks. And then um, as far as veterinary medicine, I know it's been used in a bunch of different diseases, and this is kind of true for most of the medications we'll be talking about, but from my perspective, immune-mediated dermatoses, we're not going to use this in a disease like atopy, um, but IMHA, IMPA, um, the list goes on from there. And then we start this medication at two mg per kg once daily. It's not a super expensive medication, but it does have some reasonably serious adverse effects. Um, vomiting and diarrhea are going to be the most common for those. Um, but also myelosuppression and hepatotoxicity have both been documented in some of the literature out there. Um, we've also seen pancreatitis documented. And we absolutely don't want to be using this medication in cats. Um, it's very toxic to them. And we'll get to why in a little bit here. So this is out of the Internal Medicine Journal. Um, but they did the incidence, timing, and risk factors of azathioprine hepatotoxicosis in dogs. There was 34 dogs in the study, um, and there was a 15% incidence of hepatotoxicosis. And their definition of toxicosis was a greater than two-fold increase in your ALT. 15% incidence is pretty high for something scary. Um, and then the, mean, the median increase in, of ALT was nine-fold. So we're talking like scary numbers when you're monitoring their blood work. It happens in about 14 days. The crazy thing is that only one of the dogs has had systemic illness, and it was anorexic um, and had diarrhea. But once again, 
they're getting that chemistry panel back and going, whoa, I'm stopping this, you know. Um, I'm sure if you continued the drug, on, the drug on, then there would have been more serious problems. And then they also evaluated 48 dogs for bone marrow suppression and had four dogs develop cytopenias, so 8.3%, and that took a little bit longer, so 53 days. Um, so still a significant percentage that you're going to be concerned about, and if you're using this drug, you want to talk to your owners about that possibility. And then this stuff might be a little deep, but I think it's interesting. So I'm going to nerd out for a few minutes here. But there's a lot of breed and species toxicity variability with this drug. So the pro drug, and I'm going to show you a pathway, so hopefully a graphic will make it a little bit more fun, but it's converted by, there's three pathways for this particular drug to get converted. And so it's either converted by xanthine oxidase, this thiopurine methyl transferase, TPMT, to the inactive metabolites. And then the third pathway, as I'm not going to even say that, the HRPT to its active metabolite. And this is the metabolite that gives you the therapeutic effects, but it's also the metabolite that's going to lead to adverse effects. So here's our original, and then the, this is the second metabolite that they all get converted into. But So xanthine oxidase, that's one of our pathways into um, inactive metabolites. And this TPMT is our other pathway into inactive metabolites. So if you're blocking these two enzymes, then you're going to have more active, um, more um, substrate for active metabolites. The variability actually comes from this TPMT activity. So this pathway, this one that we mentioned. So there are nine-fold differences reported in this enzyme, and this is among dog species, but giant schnauzers have... Um, really low activity, which means that you're going to have, once again, more substrate left over for the, um, the active metabolite, which is going to cause your therapeutic, but also your adverse effects. So since they have low activity, you don't want to use that drug in the species because they're going to have a higher chance of toxicity. And then Alaskan Malamutes have a really increased activity. So if you think about it, it's going to convert more of this down into this inactive pathway, and then there's going to be fewer that go into the active pathway. Uh, and then cats have dramatically reduced TPMT activity, and that's why we can't use um, this drug in that species. Uh, one more little pearl about this pathway. Um, allopurinol, so for our Dalmatians that have crystals that you need to use that drug, which I think is probably one of the few circumstances, but it's a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So once again, you're inhibiting another pathway. So if you're on this drug, you're going to have a higher risk of toxicity. We're back to moose. Surprise, we, we picked mycophenolate. Um, it's probably my, not probably, it is, it's my first go-to for a steroid sparing agent at this point. I did my residency project on it, so that's a huge bias. But also, um, I find it to be less toxic than the other ones, and it works better for most of our immune-mediated dermatoses than cyclosporin, and like I said, less toxic than azathioprine. Mycophenolate is a prodrug of mycophenolic acid, and mycophenolic acid is going to interfere with guanosine nucleotide synthesis. So just like azathioprine, it's a purine synthesis inhibitor. It also does a few other cool things with the immune system. So it's going to suppress dendritic cell maturation, and it's going to reduce monocyte recruitment. It might also have some antifibrotic properties, which I haven't really seen the effects of. We're going to start at 10, migs, 10 to 15 mg per kg twice daily. Like I said, we have reduced myelotoxicity and hepatotoxicity when we're comparing it to azathioprine. And there also is a parenteral preparation. So if you have hospitalized animals that really need an immunosuppressive agent, that's a good thing if they're not eating um, and you don't want to shove pills down their throat. For me, I use it for the immune-mediated dermatoses, and I use a second steroid sparing agent in pretty much every single case because I don't want these dogs to be on steroid, uh, steroids alone long term. So most of my dogs with immune-mediated dermatoses are on um, steroids and mycophenolate. It's used for IMHA and IMPA. Yep. Do you start at the same time to start the steroids? So that's a tricky question. Um, a lot of times I will, if they come into me and they've been on PRED at wavering doses and they still have disease, you know, so I'm worried about glucocorticoid resistance because they've been on PRED for a little while, they came out of remission quickly, usually I'll hit them hard. So I switch it to DEX and mycophenolate right, right away, like I did with that little dachshund. One thing I might do is 
say, hey, wait 24 hours or 48 hours because if one of them's going to make you sick, I want to know which one's doing it, you know? Once again, depending on how GI sensitive the creature is, you know, if, if I know that he's an easy puker or gets diarrhea easily, I might say, hey, let's start this first, give the GI tract a chance to get used to it, and then start the other one. But it also depends on how sick they are. There is one study that says it doesn't work for myasthenia gravis, so I don't know how often you guys treat that, but don't use mycophenolate. In humans, similar side effect profile than we're going to see for a lot of our immune-mediated diseases. GI upset, opportunistic infections, um, allergic reactions are reported, which I feel like that's true with pretty much every drug, um, and then neutropenia and lymphopenia. There's not a ton of literature out there for our small animals. The only thing that's been reported is diarrhea and weight loss. And we really don't have much information on cats at all, so I wouldn't use this in a cat either just because I, I just don't know the safety profile for it. I'm not comfortable doing it. The diarrhea can be really serious, so it can cause intestinal necrosis. Um, so the one study that was done, um, only five dogs, but it was treating... Uh, IMHA in hospitalized dogs with mycophenolate. And so they were on steroids, but they also used mycophenolate. And they dosed these dogs three times a day instead of twice a day. And it was actually more like 10 to 15 mg per kg three times a day. All five of the dogs got GI toxicity. So they all had soft stool diarrhea and or vomiting. And um, one of the dogs was euthanized because of the intestinal necrosis alone. So literally died because of the mycophenolate. We see diarrhea really frequently we don't see the intestinal necrosis, so, but we dose at Q12. So 10 to 15 mg per kg Q12. And when I get to that higher dose, 15 mg per kg, I start to get a little nervous. Really, I'm just more worried about them having diarrhea and soft stool than the intestinal necrosis, but I always keep that in the back of my mind. So if the dog's having diarrhea, you need to know about it, and we can mitigate it usually, but we want to make sure this dog is going to tolerate this drug. My retrospective study had 14 dogs. It was nine PFs and then five other various other diseases, and they were just N of ones. So perianal fistula, there was one vasculitis case, epidermolysis bullosa, um, the vesicular cutaneous lupus erythematosus, which um, you guys may or may not recognize, but it's the one that collies and shelties get where they get the ulcerations in their inguinal area and groin. It's weird. It's just always just collies and shelties. And then cutaneous histiocytosis, so one of the reactive histiocytoses. In our PF patients, we actually had six out of nine get full remission. Um, and keep in mind, these dogs are on steroids too. Two of the nine had partial remission and one showed no benefit. We got full remission in the epidermal lysis bullosa case and the VCLE case. No response whatsoever with perianal fistulas. And then treatment got discontinued in one dog, the one with vasculitis, because, because of adverse events, and it was diarrhea. So I have these charts, which I won't make you sit through, but just complete response is this number. This is a pemphigus foliaceous only, but complete response in these dogs, partial in these dogs, and then none in this one. And then, let's see, I think I had one, the one starred that had to, oh no, that's a reactive histiocytosis. But yeah, diarrhea, papilloma formation, neoplasia. These are neoplasia. This one actually got diagnosed with neoplasia um, two weeks into therapy. And so I don't think it's related, but once again, you know, we're talking about suppressing the immune system. The dog has diagnosed neoplasia. I don't want to keep it on this drug if I don't have to. And actually, this was retrospective, and they lost it to follow-up. So we had pretty good response. Now the question is, why did we see so much better response with pemphigus foliaceus than we did with some of these other diseases? Um, and I don't know the answer, but I guess it, I'm guessing it has to do with what arm of the immune system the drug targets better. Um, and we really don't know the immunology behind diseases like perianal fistula very well, so it's not surprising that we don't know exactly what's going on. But zero response in this dog to mycophenolate, and we have great response to cyclosporin with those cases. So potentially perianal fistula is more of a um, T-cell, um, cell-mediated immunity type of disease. And then drug interactions. Um, fluoroquinolones and metronidazole can actually, um, it reduces the enterohepatic circulation, therefore decreasing the circulation of the drug. So you're not turning it back over into the circulation. So we'll get decreased blood levels. When dogs have diarrhea, they respond really nicely to metronidazole. And I guess my question is, is that because we're reducing the blood levels of the drug or because the metronidazole, metronidazole is helping their colitis? And I don't know. But I suspect that it's just the metronidazole helping the colitis because usually we'll put them on it for five days, stop it, and they do fine 
um, on a long-term basis with their diarrhea. Cyclosporin, once again, drug interactions, but it can decrease the blood levels of mycophenolate. Proton pump inhibitors, um, and you can use the enteric coated kind if you want to. And then never use azathioprine and mycophenolate together because they're so similar. So you're just going to really increase your risk of toxicity if they're used together. Leflunamide, we really don't use very often. It's an isoxyl derivative that is converted into teriflunamide. Um, and teriflunamide targets T and B lymphocytes. Instead of the purines, we're tar- inhibiting the synthesis of pyrimidines in this case. The clinical uses, it's used in a lot of things, just like a lot of these drugs. The major paper that published data on it was for IMPA, and they had pretty good results. So one dog had no improvement, um, di- and it, but it's only, um, it only administered for a week. And for me, that's not a very long time for this medication. So maybe we would have seen improvement if we'd gone longer. Five dogs had partial and eight dogs had complete remission. And then anorexia and vomiting in one dog, which is pretty good, you know. Um, And then the dog was also on doxy and carprofen, so who knows which drug caused that adverse event. The major dermatologic indication for luflunamide is reactive histiocytosis. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, this disease. My personal pet has reactive histiocytosis. It's supposed to work really well for that disease. And it used to be uh, relatively inexpensive, but I did some good RRxing before uh, the lecture. For a 10 kg dog, 75 bucks a month. It could be worse, but when you're talking about treating bigger dogs, it's pretty expensive. So something like mycophenolate is going to be cheaper. Once again, adverse effects, pretty similar. Lethargy, vomiting, and diarrhea. You're going to want to monitor your CBC because there can be leukopenias and thrombocytopenias. And then there's all kinds of adverse events reported in the human literature like there is for every drug. Chlorambicil, Leucaron, it's a, you guys know it as a chemotherapeutic. Um, it's an alkylating agent that cross-links the DNA. So that's going to cause damage to the DNA and then um, that's going to lead to apoptosis. So the reason I bring this up is this is actually not a drug that I use very often at all. But if you've got a cat that's got pemphigus foliaceus, it's on its steroid, you got it's on its cyclosporin, you're just not seeing the results that you want to, chlorambicil would be a good option as a second-line treatment or a third-line treatment. You might get better efficacy out of it because we don't have the choices in cats that we do in dogs. So it's just something to consider. Um, and typically, the toxicity profile is pretty low. You started out at 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg by mouth every 24 to 48 hours. Like I said, I don't use it too often, but something to think about for sure. And we don't want to forget about our cats. Doxycycline. So a lot of people don't think about doxycycline as an immunomodulatory agent, but it does pretty darn well. Um, The mechanism of action, it inhibits interleukin-8, those matrix metalloproteinases. It inhibits T-cell proliferation and granuloma formation. And it also is a reactive oxygen species scavenger. So it does some cool things. We really call it immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory because it's not really immunosuppressive. You know, you're not going to get all of those side effects with doxycycline that you would with other medications, which is good because there's lower risk to it. GI side effects, esophagitis are things to worry about, but typically if, if you're giving it with food, you don't have to worry about those things. It's used primarily in dermatologic diseases for uh, sterile nodular disease, discoid lupus erythematosus, reactive histiocytosis. So I'll tell you, if I get a dog in, we call them the lumps, bumps, and draining tracts. So they're the deep lesions that have draining tracts, they're diffuse. We don't know, is, you know, primary differentials are going to be infectious versus sterile inflammatory disease. Um, you got to rule out neoplasia as well. My workup for those cases is to take biopsies, send one off for histopathology and special stains, send one off to the lab, and they're going to grow bacterial cultures, so aerobic, anaerobic, fungal, and mycobacteria. If the pathologist says not cancer, it's pyogranulomatous inflammation in the paniculus. And then my lab tells me, yeah, all your cultures are negative. I have my diagnosis for sterile nodular disease. And there's some different kind of categories, but it's mostly semantics. So we just say sterile inflammatory. I have dogs respond to doxy alone sometimes in those cases. So when I'm waiting for my cultures to come back, because it's going to take a while to do all of them, um, I put them on doxy because we talked about 
trigger factors for immune-mediated disease. Doxy treats those arthropod-borne diseases. So really, I mean, if we're treating for it, I feel less guilty about not doing the diagnostic. And then I know that if it's, not, if it's a sterile immune-mediated, I um, am actually treating for that disease, even if it's not a very powerful one. And then there's some weird mycobacterial as well as bacterial diseases that doxycycline can treat. So usually that's what I do. I biopsy and send them out the door with doxy while I'm waiting for my diagnostics to come back. We also, I mentioned reactive histiocytosis, my own personal pet. Um, she comes in and out of remission, but usually I can get her back into remission on doxycycline alone. And granted, I'm palpating her lymph nodes like a freak every day, but as soon as they're bigger than normal, I start her back on the drug, and she does great. I haven't had her on steroids in a year and a half. So, something to think about. More benign, I'll call it a cosmetic disease, but it's not really, but discoid lupus, you know, say it's just nasal, pla nasal planum le um, lesions. You can put them on doxycycline while you're waiting for your biopsy to come back. So you're not worried about systemic effects. And actually, I forgot to put a slide in, but I would say the other calcineurin inhibitor that we didn't talk about is tacrolimus, and I use it all the time. So it should have gone in right after we talked about cyclosporin. Same mechanism of action. There is an oral formulation. It's crazy expensive. Even the topical, you get a tube of it and it's like 75 bucks, which seems really expensive, but it lasts forever. So diseases where it's really focal, like DLE, I just have them do tacrolimus. Most of my perianal fistula dogs, I maintain on tacrolimus alone. And so you get them into remission with your steroids and your cyclosporin, and then tacrolimus topically can keep those dogs in remission. Dr. O'Neill, my boss, would argue that the generic doesn't work, but I have good luck with it. And the um, name brand is like 500 bucks a tube. I use the generic, we do pretty well. Um, once again, probably that same factor, if they fail, you don't know it's because of the generic or not, but um, I think most owners are not prepared for that $500 price tag, so. So I forgot to mention tacrolimus, I apologize. Doxycycline is a great thing to think about. We're gonna um, dose it at usually 10 mg, five to 10 mg for KQ12. It's used with niacinamide, which is a vitamin B analog. Um, the niacinamide is supposed to be, um, inhibits some of our immunoglobulins, like it inhibits uh, IgE-induced histamine release from mast cells. The problem with niacinamide is you have to give it three times a day, and that's a huge compliance issue. Also, I get really good results with doxycycline without it, so I'm never really encouraged <laughs> because it just becomes a compliance issue, and it's one more pill they have to give when they're giving five already. So that's me, and that's a, definitely a personal preference. I would say a lot of dermatologists still use the niacinamide. And then, um, last but not least, we have to think about our monitoring considerations. So, and this is not at a great idea, but if you're gonna do steroids for two weeks, who cares? You know, if it's a young, healthy dog, you're probably fine. For our immune-mediated dermatoses, we're talking chronic to lifelong therapy. You really wanna get a good baseline of what this dog looks like. So CBC Chem, UA, uh, if they've been on steroids before they got to you, I would do a culture um, just to make sure. Because if you get that, your analysis back and it's dilute, you don't know if there's bacteria or not. And I just say the culture is key because, you know, that's one thing too that you're not going to be able to detect if it ascends and you get pyelonephritis. You know, it's just something that I would be careful about. Um, so do that as a baseline. Does everything look okay? And then if you're adding in a new drug, you know, say you started with steroids and you're adding in a new drug at month two, I would check the blood work before you add in that new drug because you want to make sure that your new drug is not causing problems. If they get sick five days later, you want to prove that it was, you know, the new drug and not the steroids. And then usually if they're doing great, especially I've gotten their, tap their steroids tapered to what I'm going to have them on for a while, I'll check them at three months and then every six months to a year if I've got them on really do low doses of everything. And then I also say cytology on new lesions every time, and this is totally a derm thing, and you guys run into trouble because you have to charge for it. It's part of our recheck, so it's easier for us to do. But here's the, that's the segue to moose. So we had him on dex and mycophenolate for two weeks, and he had like two or three new little lesions. So we're like, ugh, this dog, you know, why isn't he responding? We have him on a more powerful steroid. We have him on a second immunosuppressive agent. Do cytology on the lesions, it's four plus cocci and neutrophils with no acapolytic cells. He's got pyoderma, you know, so it's worth doing every time. So we had a little chlorhexidine or mupirocin on those lesions and they went away. We were able to go ahead and taper our drugs. And then just as an example, at 12 weeks we had him, you want to taper your steroids first, but 
0 0.1 mg per kg of dex twice weekly. And then the, the mycophenolate's been that same for those three months, you know, because we don't get our side effects like we do with the steroids. And at that point, maybe you're like, okay, we'll do it once daily. Three more months. Okay, maybe we want to go to every other day on the mycophenolate. I taper things really slowly, especially if they're tolerating the drug. You've done your blood work. You know that there's no myelosuppression, no hepatotoxicity. You know, those reactions are idiosyncratic, and you saw that they usually happen sooner rather than later. So um, I would taper that one really slowly. And then there's a lot of references. And that's my dog. That's real cute. <laughs> Does anybody have questions? Which chlorhexidine are you using? So, yeah, so um, our name brand, and I'm not afraid to say it, but we use the Duke So um, as, as a shampoo. It's got 3% chlorhexidine and then 1% Climbazol. And the same thing with the mousse. So, important considerations for chlorhexidine are you want it to be t between 2 and 4% for good efficacy. Um, and there's a lot of great products out there. We find the owners really like the shampoo. It lathers really well. It doesn't smell strange. Um, it's got, they all have their kind of proprietary, you know, like phytosphingosine or spherules or, so, I mean, it's personal preference, what you like. I mentioned Verbac is now doing a lot of the um, antimicrobial peptides, which is the stuff your skin's supposed to make naturally to fight off bacteria, but dogs with atopy have a barrier defect. They don't make them properly. The idea is that you're, you know, avoiding resistance by doing topical therapy instead of systemic. But that's true for all of them. So. Only because another dermatologist told us last month that, um, <laughs> that some, of the, some of the shampoos are inactivating the chlorhexidine with the stuff they're adding. Oh, um, you know, I would say I trust the major name brands. To my knowledge, if it's one of your solid name brand companies that's been around forever, I would trust it. They did do some studies on the kind of um, tractor supply over-the-counter chlorhexidine and said that, found that they were not nearly as efficacious as the other ones. So I don't know if that's who they're referring to. But I'm not going to, um, I don't really have any name brand people that I would think that's happening in. Any other questions? Thanks for coming, guys.